Well, welcome to Elm Live. Today is, what is today? It's November, November 6th. Uh, welcome to Elm Live for November 6th, 2016. Uh, if you've been following along on Twitter or on Twitch notifications, you might know already that I've been doing this code member challenge, uh, doing a creative coding challenge every day. So I've been using Elm for that. And uh, if you look at the hashtag CodeVember on Twitter, you can see lots of other people uh, doing it in uh, generally JavaScript. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff you can play with. Uh, here are the ones that I've done so far, or screenshots of them, uh, from the first day, day two, and then the rest of the days I've kind of been getting into these uh, kind of random, randomly generated images. And yesterday we did a quick one using uh, Max's animation library. So today I figured it's uh, time to up the game for Code Vember. I'm going into this kind of blind, uh, but I want to learn how to use WebGL with Elm. There's a nice WebGL package. And there's actually also some uh, WebGL support built into the Elm compiler itself, which is kind of interesting. Let's see, Elm WebGL. And I actually haven't looked at this at all since Elm 0.16, so hopefully all of this still works in Elm 0.17. And also, hopefully we can learn enough today about WebGL in general to do something useful. I kind of have a high-level understanding of how uh, WebGL works, uh, and OpenGL in general, but I haven't actually done a project in it. So that's the plan for today. Um, if anyone knows any of uh, any of this stuff better than I do in the chat, feel free to uh, help me out. I am not worried about getting spoilers. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess uh, before we jump into this again, I just wanted to give one another quick reminder to those of you in the United States um, about the upcoming United States election, which is on Tuesday. Uh, it's been a big deal in the news over the past many months, so it's finally coming to a close. Uh, hopefully a good one. I guess I've talked a lot about um, different issues in the past. Actually, the one thing I wanted to look at today again was one of the sites we looked at uh, in more detail when we did some of the Black Lives Matter episodes uh, was this Campaign Zero. And they used to have a candidate guide up on here. Yeah, here we go. Um, so related to the presidential campaign, uh, you can actually look at this document in here in more detail and see some of the specific policies that Campaign Zero is uh, recommending. And they kind of have a 10-point plan to address uh, police violence in general. And you can see where each of the candidates stack up on all of those issues and their position if they have a stated position on each of those points. I also have uh, heard a lot of about um, people who have been interested in voting third party this election and to me I think uh, voting for third party candidates is great if you are doing it responsibly. Um, so if you are thinking about voting for a third party candidate this year, I would caution you to consider your motives for doing that. I know in particular among Democrats, a lot of people have some negative feelings towards Hillary in particular. Um, so my overall point, I guess, is um, if you are interested in third parties and uh, are supporting that, uh, that's great. But also think about what it's going to take to actually follow through on um, 
getting a third party agenda implemented. I think a lot of people are wrapped up right now in the presidential election itself and kind of the media frenzy related to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And after Tuesday, it's going to be time to get back to the harder, uh, more difficult and longer term work of actually enacting policies that are going to change uh, our culture for the better. So regardless of who you vote for for president, um, and personally, I endorse Hillary Clinton. Uh, regardless of the outcome of the election, we're going to have a lot of work ahead to actually make changes at the local and state and federal levels related to laws that, um, like, just changing the president is not going to, uh, in itself, change the rest of our uh, culture. So that's all I wanted to say on that. And uh, hey, welcome to the chat, Arkham, uh, who mentions that there's going to be a Paris Elm meetup in a few days on Wednesday. Great, that's exciting to hear. And hello to everyone else who has joined and watching, whether you're in the chat or not. So let's go ahead and get started. And maybe the first thing we can try to do is get one of these uh, WebGL examples up and running. And hopefully this library still works with Elmo.17. So let's see. I guess I should just clone this repository to start with. Let me copy this repo. And I've got my code member folder here, but we'll get back to that in a minute. <clears throat> All right, so what do we have here? Let's try Elm uh, package install. And then I guess let's run Elm Reactor from here and see what we can get running. So in the examples folder, uh, cube, is that an example? Okay, so it can't find math.vector3. Let's open this up in our text editor and see if we can sort out what's missing here. Uh, workspace Elm WebGL. Okay, so we're looking in the examples in cube, and this has a main in it. Okay, so this is something we should be able to use. Then math.vector3. Ah, so there's an Elm package here. Ah, great. Okay, so we just need to run Elm Reactor from the examples folder, which has a different uh, Elm package.json. Okay, so I'm going to cd into the examples folder and run Elm Reactor from here. And now go back to the root of the server. Okay, well now let's try cube.elm. And while that's building, let's take a look at what's in here. So we have a program, and hey, great, uh, it looks like it's running. And is there any interactivity here? No, it just rotates. Okay, so it looks like this all works. Uh, now we just have to learn how to use it. So why don't we read through this cube example to start with. So the view takes a scene and uses WebGL to HTML. Okay, let's see if we can maybe mess with the size of this. Yeah, okay, interesting. <clears throat> So I changed the size of this viewport, and apparently it, the way this is drawing is just scaling everything to that. 
subscriptions. We're using the animation frame diffs. I am not familiar with that package. Let's see, that must come from Elmlang animation frame. Okay, let's look up that really quickly. Let's see, browsers have their own loop. It's helpful to sync up to the refresh rate. And diffs. I think diffs means that this value we get uh, from the subscription is the amount of time since the previous uh, message, whereas the times gives the timestamp on every message. Okay. Then our update function takes a delta time, so the model here is just an integer of how much time, uh, and theta. So theta is the model, and dt is the new value from the subscription. So we just add that, divide it by 5,000, and get command.none. Okay, so if we change this, it should speed things up. So if we change that to 500, yeah, that makes the cube rotate faster. All right. Then we define some meshes. So we have a vertex, which is a color and a position, both of which are vectors of three integers. Where does that come from? So math.vector3. Let's find that package. I think that's this linear algebra package. There was a thread on the mailing list, on the Elm Discuss mailing list recently. Um, where the author was asking about renaming this to something else. So let's look that one up. Linear algebra. Great. So this has math vector 3, a vec 3. Ah, is an opaque value, but it basically contains three floats. Okay, got it. So we have color, which is three floats, and position, which is three floats. Here's the cube. Uh, right, front, top. Ah, and the comments are getting moved around because of Elm format. So this is the right, front, top, the left, front, top, left, bottom, top. Okay, and those are all the coordinates of the corners of the cube. Then triangle. Is that something we defined? Probably not. I'm going to guess the triangle comes from the WebGL package. So what does this do? We concat all of these. And what does this give back? It gives back a drawable. Okay, so I'm assuming that comes from the WebGL package as well. So let's take a look in here. So we've got textures, texture filters, shaders, renderables, errors, drawables. Ah, and the triangle is a drawable. And a, draw, a triangle takes a list of tuples, and each tuple has attributes. Okay, and we have a drawable of vertexes. So our attributes are vertexes. Huh, this is already getting kind of complicated. But it looks like the shapes we have are triangles, lines, line strips, line loops, points, triangle fans, and triangle strips. Okay, and I happen to know those roughly correspond to the basic uh, rendering primitives that you have available in OpenGL. Uh, let me know if this spinning cube is distracting, by the way. And I can, I can pause it or hide it. <clears throat> okay, um, and so we found out what drawable and what triangle are, and list concat. So what does face do? Face takes a color, it looks like, and in this case, four corners. Okay, so this is actually something defined here for drawing squares with a color, the four corners, 
and it gives back a list of uh, triples, which essentially represent triangles. And then we do that for every face. We can cat all of the points from each face together and then create a triangle uh, drawable. Okay, that is making sense to me so far. Uh, if anyone's not following along, just let me know in chat and I can try to explain in more detail, what, at least what I'm understanding. So our face, we define a color. We take the raw color and convert it to RGB. Then we split it back out and use to float. Is 2RGB defined in here? I'm guessing it's defined elsewhere. Okay, interesting. That seems like kind of a roundabout uh, thing to do. So maybe we can try, let's see. So if we put all zeros in here, that should make our cube black. Yeah, got it. And then if we were to only use the red component, this should give us a gray cube. Okay, and it still has light shading, great. So what I'd like to try doing here is avoid... Oh, oh, I see. Raw color is actually a color. Okay, for some reason I was thinking it was a vector, mainly because I saw this up here where a vector was a, a vec3. Okay, so I was just confused. So we start with an elm color, we convert it to RGB, and then convert it into a vector. Got it. <clears throat> and then we create a vertex, which has the color and the position. And then we create two triangles that together form the square. Okay. And why don't we try this for a moment? Um, so there's the colors again. I want to try rendering each of these triangles in a different color. So let's convert this to a new function and then vertex to position color to position and then these will color with that color and color two why don't we just hard code this uh, 0.5 so have a nice gray there we need the leading zeros in elm there we go okay so i'm just playing around here a little bit but i feel like that was useful to verify that we understand how to mess with this. And I'm going to slow this back down. Uh, let's see. Yeah, sorry the stream is buffering. Um, yeah, several other of the streamers, uh, like Greg and Danny, um, were both having trouble with that. Or no, Greg and Luke were both having trouble with the stream buffering. Uh, I've set the stream rate down to 1300 kilobits per second which is from what i've read extraordinarily low already compared to a lot of the gaming streams out there so uh sorry i can't help with that anymore but yeah i um oh yeah so on the on the youtube front if you were following me on twitter uh, when I started posting videos every day for Code Vember, YouTube started uh, taking them down, saying that there was, well, they weren't quite sure why. You can go look on my Twitter if you want to see the message. But in any case, after the third video that I appealed, uh, it seems like I can upload again to YouTube without, um, without having the videos immediately flagged. So hopefully that'll continue. Um, but I am going to be exploring in the future, um, figuring out how to use open source tools to self-host videos for streaming. So I'll be looking into that more in the future um, and probably doing some open source focused streams that aren't Elm specific. 
But for the moment, uh, it looks like I am having success uploading to YouTube again. So, um, so that's the story with that. All right. So I think we're maybe at the end of this. No, I guess we have to understand the camera setup. All right. So we have our scene. Scene is going to render, and we'll have a vertex shader, a fragment shader, our cube, which we saw, and uniforms from an angle. Okay, and the angle is our model and is what's causing this to rotate. Uniforms, from what I understand, correspond to like which direction things are pointing. What do we give? So we get a rotation, a perspective, a camera, and a shade. I am not really sure what any of those do. If anyone is familiar with OpenGL and can give us a quick rundown of what all that uh, means, let us know in the chat. And let's jump over to the documentation here. Okay, so here's the render which we're using. It takes a shader uh, of attributes our vertex shader, then the then the fragment. Whoops, where to go? Then the fragment shader, then the thing we're going to draw, then our uniforms. Ah, so the uniforms are just data that get provided to the shaders again. Okay, and we get a renderable. So the attributes are coming from the drawable, and this is. It looks like we get to define our own data structure here. So in our case, we have this record which contains a color and a position. And then the uniforms is this configuration data. Ah, got it. So uniforms, I'm recalling now in OpenGL, refers to uh, data that is essentially constant for a single frame rendering. <coughs> And then the attributes here are specific to each uh, vertex that we're rendering. And then the varyings, interesting. So where do those come from? All right, I don't know. But in any case, let's see, do we even have a function here? So this is a shader. Our vertex shader takes attributes, which have a position and a color. And we shouldn't actually need this part of the record. It should work fine without that. And the same thing here, our uniforms. We are, ah, so here the uniforms actually have an extra thing in it. Okay. I'm going to clean this up a little bit and call this our uniforms. Make this a type alias. And split this out. And then this is going to be our uniforms. And then what else is the vertex shader getting? It gets the varyings. So the V color varies. Oh, I see. So the varyings are the data structure um, that is passed, that's produced by the vertex shader and is consumed by the fragment shader. Okay, that kind of makes sense. And let's see. Hey, Greg. So Greg's suggesting we read the readme for this WebGL package. Whoops, how do I get to the readme? There it is. <clears throat> so there's meshes and shaders. The mesh is about triangles. You create and update the message mesh, meshes on the CPU. 
meshes get sent to the GPU. So try not to create new meshes when possible. Got it. And maybe make smaller pieces. Okay, if you wanted to make a skeleton, each bone could be separate, and then you can rotate each part independently. Got it. Shader turns the messages in mesh meshes. <laughs> Shaders turn the meshes into pictures. In Elm, we use GLSL. Great. And we take the uniforms and the attributes from the mesh to make the vertex shader, which gives back a position and some arbitrary data, which gets sent into the fragment shader along with the uniforms, which gives the color. Okay. Ah, fragment shaders are also pixel shaders. Okay. Cool. And then there's some details about optimizing, and then they talk about writing shaders, which is written in kind of a C-like language. Okay. Cool. So that's kind of the basics. Uh, what I want to start building today is to kind of make like a rotating shape um, out of cubes. So I'm hoping we won't really have to write much in terms of the shaders. So here's the vertex shader. This takes a position and a color. The perspective camera rotation, and then it's going to produce the output color, which it just passes through, and then it creates the position also by multiplying, okay, the perspective, the camera rotation, and the position. Got it. And then the fragment shader has a float. Uh, oh, I guess it's specifying the precision, the precision of floats. Uniform. We get the shade from our uniforms, and we get our varying from the vertex shader, and then we produce the color by multiplying. Okay, so the shaders here are relatively simple. And it looks like the shade just is a <clears throat> scaling factor for the color. Let's try, if we put this at 0.5, maybe we will get a darker cube. Oh, actually, we get a lighter cube. If we make shade 1, we get, okay, a more colored cube, I guess. <clears throat> okay. Cool. So, I think, I think I'm ready to start my own little sketch then. And what I'm think I'm going to do is just copy this uh, example code over because I basically do want to use cubes. So I think I'm just going to start with this example. And before we do that, I guess let's take a quick look at the other examples. So here's a crate, which is using tech image texture texture. Man, this is like a tongue twister episode of Elm Live. <laughs> um, first person, walk around. Ah, okay. And here is just using keyboard controls to manipulate the camera, probably. Uh, mouse bug. Okay, so we use the mouse to control something. And thwomp. Okay, and it rotates based on the mouse to look at us. And triangle. Okay, and it's just a rotating triangle. All right, so I'll just keep that in the back of my mind if there's any other techniques that we want to grab. Ah, okay, and there's where the images are stored, and screenshots are just screenshots of that. Okay, perfect. 
So I'm going to kill that and I'm going to copy this code, kill Elm Reactor, and let's go back to my code vember folder. <clears throat> and we already have an Elm package set up, but we're going to need to install a few more things. I'm going to make a folder for today, day six. And I guess open this up in Atom. And we are going to make our main.elm in here. I'm going to paste that cube example and save it. And we should have some imports we need to add. OK, so this math vector 3 was from Elm community slash Elm linear algebra. If I can spell it, uh, Elm package install. Great. And then we're also going to need the animation frame and the WebGL library. And this is also an Elm community, Elm WebGL. So let's install that. And then I think the animation frame. Uh, yep. And that was elmlang slash animation frame, I think. Let's double check that. Okay. Oops. Select that. All right, this folder is getting kind of messy, um, but there's our updated Elm package JSON. Okay, so that compiles. So uh, also, if you go back to CodeVember day one, we installed uh, the Elm-Live command line uh, development server. So I already have that installed here, so I'm going to run it from my node modules folder and tell it which file we want to be working with, which is day6 slash main.elm. And now we should have our live reloading dev server. Cool. There it is. So I'm going to go back and undo a few of these changes. So this thing about two different colors we can get rid of. And vertex one we can rename back to just vertex. <clears throat> okay, so there's our basic uh, cube. So let's see. I guess I'd like to put this on a black background, first of all. So what kind of um, attributes does this WebGL uh, to HTML function take? Looks like it might just take um, HTML attributes. Implicitly configured, and it takes a list of HTML attributes. Okay, so let's try setting a style on here to set the background color. Um, HTML.attributes.style background color uh, black. Okay, and then let's make this a little bit larger to fill our whole screen. It's been using 750 by 500 for the other uh, code member projects. Okay. And then let's try, um, I think there's a problem with our perspective, which is 
messing up the aspect ratio since uh, we used to have the initial example had a square WebGL uh, canvas and now we have a, what is this like a 3 to 2 aspect ratio so let's see if we can figure out how to convert the perspective I'm assuming make perspective oh it's not in here all right then I'm gonna guess that it's in the linear algebra package cool there it is so this is the field of view in the y-axis that axis the aspect ratio okay and the near distance and the far distance okay so I think we just need to adjust the aspect ratio which is no longer one it's now three over two cool there we go and uh, ultimately, we'd probably want to make this pass in the width and height of the canvas or something like that. But this will do for now. <clears throat> All right. So our next, excuse me, our next step is. So the uniforms are basically the model data that's getting passed to the WebGL rendering, if I was understanding the README for the WebGL package correctly. So I think any data that our model needs is going to go in here. And then our sh vertex shader, interesting, is essentially a program that given each of the meshes and the uniforms is oh no how does this work every every point that we want to render needs to appear in our mesh okay so i think the first thing we need to do is change our mesh to have more uh, vertexes in it. Okay, this is starting to make sense to me. And then, okay, so here's the plan. I want to add multiple cubes to start out, and then I want to kind of have the cubes rotate based on different layers that they're in. So I think we're going to need to add additional information to these vertexes that are stored in the meshes. Then we can modify our vertex shader uh, so that depending on the values of each vertex, it can rotate a different amount depending on other data that we put into our uniforms. So I hope everybody's with me on that, but it's just kind of starting to get come together in my head of how all this is supposed to be hooked up. So our first goal then is to make multiple cubes. So here's where we're ultimately specifying the cube for the scene. And interestingly, this gives a list of renderables. So maybe we can just add a second one. Let's see what happens if we add a second one. So now we have two cubes, and I believe they're overlapping. So let's try changing the angle on the second one. Yeah, okay. There we go. So here we can have multiple cubes, and we can give different data for each uh, cube. And then the way things are broken up into renderers is just to allow uh, the rendering to be optimized. Okay. So we need in our um, we need in our uniforms then a translation or essentially. So I want to actually add a integers, which are going to be an X and a Y, and I'm going to kind of make a two-dimensional shape as a grid of cubes and then have the cubes rotate. 
So if we add these parameters to the uniforms, then this will be at 0, 0, and this will be at 0, negative 1. Then we want to add, uh, here we'll have the location, or I guess it'll call, let's call it the x offset, which, oh, no, actually we can have a vector here, right? So let's call this position then, and we're going to make a vec3 of x, y, 0. And now, uh, oh, vec3, and we have to two float these. Uh, oh, and also these shouldn't be uh, in parens, two float. Okay, like that. And then our uniforms, okay, we need to add this here. Um, position, and I'm not sure why all these others are mat fours. Maybe that's important. And we have position in here. Okay, and it's converting the uh, position into an I okay, so position is coming from the attributes for each vertex first of all. So we shouldn't use that name here. Let's call it offset. Then let's just make this into a vec four or a mat four. I'm not sure what the difference is. Let's look at this linear algebra again. How do we make one of these? We can, oh, okay, so we can make translate. We can make a translate vector. Okay, so every one of these vectors corresponds to a 3D transformation. So we'll use make translate. Is that what it was called? Yeah, make translate, uh, which will take a vec3 with the x and the y and no z. Okay, so now we have a new piece of data that we can use in our vertex shader in our uniforms. And then we have a uniform, which is a matrix four called offset. And we should be able to just multiply it in here. <laughs> okay, so something happened. Uh, maybe the order of multiplying this matters. And here's where my lack of knowledge of um, Oh, okay, that actually worked. My lack of knowledge of 3D transforms might eventually be a problem here. <clears throat> okay, so now let's have these both use the same angle. So now we have two cubes rotating uh, together. Let's see, and I'm actually going to, for the moment, turn off the rotation. Well, nah, I kind of like it there. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up uh, more cubes. And let's try making like a plus shape. So we'll have zero, zero, we will have uh, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, and 1, 0, and negative 1, 
zero. Cool. And let's try having all of these rotate in sync or like around a common axis. So I think we can do that by changing where we apply this rotation. And nope, that's not the right place. <laughs> not there. <laughs> not there either. Ah, so actually, it's maybe the offset that needs to go in a different place here before the rotation. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we have our rotating plus overall. I want to have these cubes be a bit smaller. So maybe we can just build this uh, scale. So I'm realizing we can just build this offset matrix, which is really a translation matrix. So I'm going to re, or a transformation. So I'm going to rename this here uh, to be called transform. And it did not like that, ah, because this doesn't compile now. Transform. All right. So we have this transformation uh, matrix that we can apply and create a different one for each cube. So I want to combine a scale into, into this. So in that case, rather than converting a vector, I'm going to start with the identity matrix and then call translate, which should, uh, which takes a vec3. Uh, we can also use translate3 to just pass all the arguments. And actually, before we translate it, I want to scale it. So we'll have a scale 3, which will take 0 0.8. And uh, it doesn't know what kind of identity. So this is the math dot matrix for identity. And that scaled the cubes. But they're not far enough apart. So I think we need to uh, make the translate move farther. Yeah, okay. So let's put the scale at one for a moment and get these to figure out how far apart these need to be. Okay, so at three they're separated out. Hmm, actually if we do that then we uh, don't really need even need the scaling. That's basically the layout that I was looking for. <clears throat> so now I want to change how this rotation works. So this rotation is currently, what is it doing? doing a whole bunch of stuff. It's multiplying two rotations together. Okay, let's turn off one of those. Yeah, okay, and I want this to rotate just horizontally. 
There we go. Okay, so that's our rotation. Now I need the camera to be farther out. So let's take a look at this make look at function, which I'm going to guess is in the linear algebra package. Make look at. So this takes the i, which is the location of the camera, the location of the focused object, and the up direction. Okay. So we want to move the i, which is the first parameter, uh, which is at x, y, and z. Let's try moving this farther out, maybe to 15z. There we go. <clears throat> Cool. Uh, so I think that's a good start. Uh, let's take a short break and I will be back in just a few minutes. And after that, uh, what I want to do is basically get each of these rows of cubes to rotate um, at a different time, first of all. And then maybe after that, we can try to use the animation package that we used yesterday to have a particular kind of easing function uh, for the animations. So we will do that right after this short break. I uh, will see you then. Mm -hmm. 